PeoriaLife.com. Hello, folks, and welcome to the Peoria Life Show. I am your host, Anshuman Reddy. Today, we have an amazing show for you. Today, we have a local boxing legend of Peoria, Francis Sargent. So, can you tell us about your journey into the world of boxing? What inspired you to pursue boxing in the first place? It was a sport I picked up because of the fact when I was going to high school, a lot of my friends, a lot of people I know that grew up with, they were good in other sports like baseball, football, and of that nature. But I tried it, and I rode the bench, or I sat on the bench quite a bit. But I found a sport that was one-on-one, -on -one, and you have to get something to go on in order to be in this sport. So I tried boxing. Yeah, I can relate to that. Because if I actually got into martial arts because I took karate back in the day. I followed my brother's example. Mm -hmm. Like, I really couldn't get into other sports either because basically you're in front of a bunch of people. There's still a lot of group coordination. That itself is a pain. But with martial arts and boxing included, I know a lot of some folks don't consider boxing and martial art, but it's about basically controlling what you can control yourself. It's about self-mastery. So I can understand that. So, what what do you consider the most defining moments of your boxing career? Well, meeting the people that I've met in the past, and some of the champions that I've met and sparred with in the past, and going to different places like a journey. You know, you have to take your chance and do whatever you have to do, but you have to be on top of whatever you do. Are there any specific fights or achievements that you that matter to you the most? Yes, sir. Most of the, my achievement was winning the state golden gloves. And that was something I experienced myself because of the fact that I got started the sport late. But while I was doing it, I was enjoying doing it. And I wanted to know what kind of steps I could take. That's why I went into the pros because of my age. I was kind of old to start with the amateurs. So I stepped right up into the pros. And that's when I kind of had a, little, a lot more different meanings for the sport. Like... Which fight in particular, when you were a pro, would do you remember the most? It was the fight that I had with a young man. He was, his, his hometown was, uh, he was from, uh, it was, was the name? I get that name. It's hard to remember some of these gentlemen's name. I met him in the amateurs, uh, and, he, and he beat me. We were supposed to put on an exhibition fight. And the amateurs, we were in Galesburg, Illinois. His name was Arnett Turn. I hate to say names, but that's what it was. We met each other in the pros after on like my second and third fight. And it was surprising because he did everything in the amateurs because we were just supposed to put on an exhibition fight for the other people because we were only big people there in the crowd. So they picked us up. He was heavier than I was. His division was heavier than I was. But they needed somebody to go close to his division to put on an exhibition way to kind of get the people worked up and get them going. I can relate to that. Like, I confess I've been beaten before by people. Like, back when I was training kids in martial arts at Manual, one of my students beat me. Really young, really young guy. Like, he does boxing as a career. Really athletic. He's basically, he's on the cross, he was on the wrestling team and the cross country team. It's, not, it's never a shame to lose to people who are younger to you. Because the way I see it is this. If we, if we basically, if the younger beat generation can't beat, the, beat us, it's kind of like we failed them. Because we always, there's always an expectation you want the next generation to be better than the last. True. True. Like, but at the same time, the defeat, you don't feel it as a defeat. It's almost like you're actually proud of getting beaten. That's true. So, have you, have you inspired others? I do believe I have inspired others by just being the fact that I'm still around and I'm not, I took what I had coming to me, but I was still stuck around to see what the outcome would be. And by me saying that, it's just by me having, helping kids from ages from eight up that I can deal with and I'm trying to influence them to make them do better or to keep everything right in what they're doing. I mean... As someone who's also taught kids, I, that's a relatable theory. Like seeing them grow, seeing them become. It's always, they're always, they always miss, making mistakes is part of the deal. I mean, you don't do go to the gym and train in class to show off. 
is because you learn how to be better and realize what you're doing wrong. Because actually, this is just me confessing. Like, I realized something while I was doing wrong just very recently. That I wasn't rotating and using my trapezius muscles to punch, basically. Because basically, the thing about punching, most people, a lot of people don't realize that you use your whole body. The hips, the shoulders, the legs, the arms, everything. Because you're putting everything... Because basically, like I said, it's boxing's about self mastery. True. So back when you were fighting, how did you? How would you prepare for your fights? Running was amazing. That was the heaviest necessity that you had to have done. Was running your setups, and then watch what you eat, watch what you do, be careful where you go. You just have to to get your body ready. You have to talk to your body, so to say. Now, if you talk to your body, you got to make them do what you want them to do. It gets lazy, too. Actually, yeah, that's understandable. Like, basically, cardio is... A lot of boys, even at the gym, say that they don't hate cardio. But that's most of what martial arts is. is. Maintaining your heart rate. It's not... not it's not like Muhammad Ali once said that. It's not when he do, does sit-ups. He will only start counting after they started hurting, basically. Basically, seeing how far you can go. Like car, also the core is also an important part of, like basically the core rotation of your body. Mm -hmm. The core is a good part part of that. Mm -hmm. But also being, I understand diet too. Like sometimes when I eat heavy food, I just don't want to exercise. I just want to curl up into a ball and sleep in my bed. Yeah, but it's not to cut you off, you know. Um, like they say, you know, in boxing, you know, the expression is that I use a lot. If you kill the body, they hit a fall. So in other words, you have to be ready to defend yourself in all aspects of it. Because the person's going to come at you, you have no idea what he knows or what you know. And you just get out there and it's like a war, basically, but it's a legal war. Can, can I say a little bit on that uh, cardio? Uh, I know a lot of kids get in the ring and then they run, run out of gas, like in the first or second round. So that, that running and getting your wind up is the most important right, part of boxing. Right. Our youngest son, up. I would always fought when he was in the silver gloves, and he always ran out of gas in the second round. But once he got into high school and they started doing all that, you know, the hell week and training and real hard, then he ended up win, winning the golden gloves. And the outstanding boxer in the golden gloves. Because he got that cardio from, from football. Yeah. But when he was boxing, he didn't, he, didn't want to, he didn't want to do that cardio. Yeah, basically, I can, I can react... Re I can react relate to that. But basically, sometimes you have you will have to do other sports to understand basically how your body works. Like right. I know this is not this is just pure fiction, but in, Ro in Rocky Three, basically, after he lost after Rocky lost to Clubba, Apollo Creed made him yeah. go swim, go swimming, basically telling him work the muscles you haven't worked before, mm -hmm. basically. And um, that's true because a lot of times you know, Rocky was a good movie, but people don't understand that that was a movie. You know, you can't do a lot of things in Rocky and in this sport or even in Taekwondo or Muay Thai, whatever sport it might be. You have to sit down and you have to exercise, you have to run, you have to do things that you don't want to do normally. And that's just actually just following the streets. That's true, because there's an old Greek, there's an old Stoic saying, if they're, they're, they are Greek and Roman philosophers. There's always two choices. One, the pain of discipline or second, the pain of shame. You always have to choose one or the other. That's right. That's very true. That's very true. You have to be careful what you do. You know, it's easy to, 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 to be swooped up in something that ain't fair to you, but it's fair to others because they're going to be happy doing what they're doing. You just want to join the crowd. But a lot of times I did at my age, I started boxing at a later age. I've done it early. But the reason why I quit, because I didn't know what I was doing. But then I came back when I got a little mature, so to say. And I learned what to do. I know how to listen. I continue on to do what I had to do to get the things done. Because I was the oldest one to win the Golden Gloves in Springfield, Illinois. I was 27 years old. And, you know, usually Golden Gloves is around 18, 20, you know, things like that. But I was 27 years old. I beat a gentleman over 100 fights. That's actually, most people don't realize this about him. You know, your story reminds me of Rocky Machado. 
Because he actually started later than most fighters. Yeah. But the, he was a monster in the ring. He was. Rocky, Rocky. But, Rocky is not the country over in there, but Rocky was good, was good. But some of the things in it, you'd have to understand that they were making a movie. Not, no, not it's Rocky. It's my, the boxer, Mark. Oh, Rocky the, Marshall. Oh, the, oh, the real Rocky Marshall, yeah. Oh, he was, he was definitely good. He wasn't fake. He wasn't nothing about it. He knocked out all those guys and he beat them all too. The original Rocky Marciano was a, uh, he was gifted. Yes, he was. The fact that basically the only thing it took basically, he only was, he had, he's the only boxer out there with a 50, well, correct. 49. All right, oh, right, 49. No. It's only broken by one person. Roger Mayweather. Yes. So, he tied his record. He didn't broke it too, I think. So here's so when you were in the ring, were there any what strategies or tactics did you like to use? Well, a lot of times that would depend basically on my opponent. I had a lot of people that aggressive. The ones that were aggressive, you have to learn how to just kind of maneuver with those. I was the kind of person I, I wouldn't sit still to be knocked out. If you catch me, you have to catch me on the move. You know, if you trigger me or take me up in the corner, that's different. But as far as just coming out, I'm going to knock you straight out. No, you couldn't do it. So basically you were about maneuvering around your opponent I and wearing down. That's what I was exactly. You had to move. That was Muhammad Ali. Uh, you adopted I, Muhammad Ali's I, tactic. I did. I mean, Shigurei, I mean, Shigurei Leonard, Muhammad Ali. I like those those kinds of stuff because the ones that, like Mike Tyson is a great fighter. I'm not taking no respect from the man. The man is tip top. He's on top. But you cannot stand in front of a car and don't expect to get hit, or a truck, or another person. That's understandable. Like, they're different. Some folks, it's best basically based on what your style is. Like, mm -hmm. some fo folks like being as nimble as wind. Others like hitting, like, overwhelming force like a mountain. True that. Like... Also, like there's a whole, there's just a rhythm in fighting. Like mm -hmm. prefer like one, my mm -hmm. old kickboxing coach, you taught me a combo where you jab, but then you, you throw throwing a hook instead of doing the cross. Yeah. Because you always it's like you always assume you go from left to right because you pivot, just you distribute your weight, rotate your hips and your shoulders, mm -hmm. to basically deliver the kinetic force into your blows. But by doing the jab cr hook, you're basically just, you're basically disrupting the rhythm. You are. You are. It's a basic guy. You do it. Now, there was a gentleman, not to throw the conversation, but the way he did it was, like there was a person called James Quick Tillis, and there was Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson was knocking out everybody, one, two, three, four, like it was nothing. But all the person would have to do is to move. James Quick Tillis is the first person to do that. He moved, so Mike Tyson didn't knock him out. I sparred James Quick Tillis probably 20 rounds or more. But I mean, he was quick. He just didn't have a lot of power. He moved with his punches, and that's what messed him up. But he was a great boxer. Still. That, that's understandable. Make, like, when you mean by moving your punches, you mean step into the punches? Step into the punch. And you know, you hit to run. Like, Ali was a great man on that. But he had a little bit of power with him. But Ali moved so much, he would take a lot of his power off his punch. Because he's constantly moving. You know, if you watch a lot of fighters these days, boxers these days, that move a lot and punch a lot, they're losing a lot of power because of the fact they're not getting that full grip because they're moving, trying to stay with their opponent. But I like, what I prefer to do is I do move, but then the moment I la I, the punch is about to land, I, I stop. Mm -hmm. it, well, just for the jabs and the hook, because mm -hmm. both the jab and the hook are, are evolved with the propelling motion of going forward. Mm -hmm. With the cross and the uppercut, you do want to stay still. You have to, in order to make, in order to make that make connection. Your uppercut, your hooks, they almost have to be almost at a standstill. Because most people think of punching as a, in, an explosive action, but it's more of an implosion. implosion. They mix that punch out with the jab. The jab is something to get you on target. Like it all starts in the legs. Like it you does. press, you press into. Like I actually watched this video online that says. If you try trying to box with your on your tippy toes, you're not just imagine an exercise where you push your your hand against your arm against a wall. But if you do it on your tippy toes, you're just going to be pushed back away from it. Sure. What you want to do is dig into the ground so you can right. push against it. Right, make you stationary. Yeah, that's true.
So when you were in your prime, what was your regiment? Well, I'm not gonna lie. You know, I, I, I watched a lot of TV. I mean, those people like the Ali, Sugar Ray Leonard, and a lot of those guys. You know, the movement was great. You know, but there's only times when you can move the size you can. For, for like, I get a lot of a lot of my boxing matches. Basically, there's probably been out of 23 fights, probably. You know, I've probably moved a whole six, eight rounds. You know, I can actually say that, but. So, you know, you have to fight when you have to fight. That's all I can say, too. So whenever, so basically when you were training back when you were doing your date regiment, as in, like, hitting the bags, how many, like, how many push-ups would you do? How would you start? Oh, I, I, the first thing I would do, you never come to the gym and go straight to the bag. You don't ever want to do that. As a, you know, as a young kid or kids I train with these days, you never walk in the bag, run to the gym, take your shoes off, start punching the bag. You loosen up before you get get all. You loosen up. You just set ups out the way, pull ups or whatever you do. But you don't want to go right to hit no heavy bag because that's gonna jar your bones. It's not good. Yeah, I understand that. You want to always stretch out first. Stretch out first. That is a weakness of mine. I do forget to stretch. Yeah, loosen up best you can. You don't want to go straight to hit the heavy bag. If you like, you're running. It's the, it's the majority of, of boxing and Muay Thai and Taekwondo, all sports. But in boxing, you know, running would be the basic thing to do. Like when I was different, I would always run, go to the gym. I very seldom, like I did do it a few times, a lot of times. I ran in the morning, but most of my runnings was in the afternoon after I got off my job. I go run and go right to the gym. Uh, that's understandable because fitness is most people do don't realize it's not a it's not something you do but it's a requirement. It's true. Unfortunately, many people because it's understandable people are mentally exhausted from work. They basically have to go home. But mm-hmm. there's sort of a feeling that after you exercise and te- for an hour and intensely to your very limits, you feel almost like you're more alive and so is the world. I do. I, I felt like that quite a bit. I mean. At the time when I was doing it, I always figured like a mile around. For each round, each mile that you run, that'd be like going a, a good boxing match round, you know. But you know, you have to be careful what you do out there because there's, there's just a lot of things out there that throw you off, you know, like people stop you, what's going on. That slows you down. When you go out there and tend to do something, do it. Talk to the people later, I'll call you later or something like that. But, that is understandable because the mo- body influences the mind and vice it versa. Does. So understandable, like what areas when you were w- working on as a boxer, wh- which areas of your body did you focus on building the most? My wind and my chest and my stomach. Understand. You gotta get those sit-ups in. You want to do that running because of that area. You need that wind. You know, like I said, I'd always think around. I go like a mile around. Sometimes I get out there and run, run, run. Just run for the heck of it, just, just to go. Every day I would do that. But they said the concrete will beat you up and it will. But you gotta be careful sometimes when you, when you run and when you run, how often you run. Like now I still go out and run, but I run a lot, a lot of times on concrete. I shouldn't, but I do. I'm trying to beat that case, but that, that grass, you know, it got holes, they got dips, and they got this, that, and the other, and so you gotta be careful in grass when you run. Yeah, that's very understandable. So, what role do you believe discipline and perseverance played in your success as a boxer, or in just in general in your life? Well, when I was a person, well, I got a cousin named William Jr. Jose, he fought Everybody from Mike Tyson down. And I mean, he's my, my first cousin. And we we had a connection. He actually generally got me into boxing because the time I got there, he had fought everybody, you know. He had fought so many different people. I mean, he's, he was rated like number two in the nation as an amateur. And so, you know, we did pretty good together. You know, he was my sparring partner. He kept me going. From there, we went to James Quick Tillis. And then with the Marvin Johnson, three-time light heavyweight champion of the world. And we was his chief sparring partner. We worked out with so many different people, Leroy, Leroy Murphy, 
Michael Brothers. I mean, we had a great time. That's amazing. Like, not only that, it seems like not just you, but also your whole family, brothers and cousins, are they have their own boxing stories. Yeah, my oldest brother, he's passed now, bless his heart, but still, you know, he he worked out with uh, Sonny Liston. He used to call him Jim Tiger. He fought in the middleweight division. He was a real good boxer, too. He fought middleweight. He had a different style doing it back then because he was back there with, you know, Sullivan and all the different people. So, so how do you handle the expectations and the pressure that come from being a prominent figure in the boxing world? Well, a lot of times, you know, I like to meet people and see people. I love this when people come to me and say, oh, how you doing? So rather than, you know, what I could have did or what's it going to be like here, I can't tell you what it would be like. You have to try it yourself. You know, I can explain to you and tell you about what I've done in the past and this, that, and the other, but I'm not, I'm not a show off. I just like to talk to people. I like to tell you, well, yeah. I've been here, I go there, my wife and I, we go a lot of different places. We meet a lot of people. But the boxing is, 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 is just always in the back of my mind because I mean, I love this sport. I will encourage other kids too that based on boxing, to get yourself ready as far as education is number one because I can't take a dummy into the ring. And most of the kids I tell these days that I train now, I say, look, if you got homework, do it. You got you got to know what two and two is to come box because if I tell you to do something, if you can't do it, that makes me look bad, and I can't win unless you win. That's understandable. Discipline is the core tenet of all martial arts styles. Yeah. Basically, using it here. Well, but there is some truth. You do need to use your head in the ring and when you you're do. training. But there's sort of a thing. You, you there is something you are right about it. There's something you just can't explain out loud. Like when you fight, you each person that goes through their own experience. Like for me, like I've tried watching a bunch of videos to or watch, listening to other folks in the gym to figure out my. Then I realized I had to figure out my own style on my own. Because it's kind of like a Zen kind of journey in some ways, where you're basically going through a thing of self exploration. And that's true because I mean, I, I like my kids, you know, my sons. They started out doing Taekwondo when they were three and four years old. Then when they got a little older, back in the days you could you could you could go box at pretty much any age, but now that they put an age on limit on it. So my boys both my boys box, they both won state championships in boxing, they both won state championships in taekwondo. My daughter, she she did her Taekwondo thing too. She got all the way up to her red belt. But her mother took out and wanted to do another thing that was ballet. As long as she was doing something that had something to do with sports, you know what I mean? Even though ballet is still as a woman's sport. But she done that. She did Taekwondo also. But I mean, I just always keep in their mind to try to keep something going. But the first thing is education. Because if you can't get to explain something to you, if you can't add, if you can't subtract. I, that's a, that's understandable. I can relate to that too. Because okay, this is just so, an embarrassing story on my part. I used to look down on ballet when when I was younger, back in my <laughs> or earlier martial arts oh, days. Yeah, I took it. Yeah. So the here's the thing. However, ballet in when you take ballet, it still requires a lot of the same things as boxing: cardio, mastery of your muscles and your body, basically. Yes. And, and basically, if you're not careful, you will injure yourself Very potentially, much. in the worst way possible. So in general, it always not just, but also non-sports related stuff. It always requires discipline and self-mastery. I mean, I think I'm, I reason why I train martial arts, and I think you do this also, is because it's not just about being someone in the ring or getting attention, but also discovering yourself and self-betterment. And it helps you, my mind, my wife too. It's better if somebody come to you and say what's happening. It's better to say how you're doing. You know, I mean, I talk a lot to a lot of people that understand that I'm just not the way I used to be. You know, I mean, I'm, it's not what I want to do. I, my boys, they did pretty good. My daughter did good. So uh, they do they ball. They got that told I stress them all. I tell them first, education is first. From there, you can go from there. But you got to get that education. Because if I tell you to do something, you got to know how to do it. Illustrate the best way you can. 
Taekwondo, Muay Thai, boxing, anything that pertains to sports is what I want them to try to do with their own kids, I tell them that. So, from what I've seen, you really value sportsmanship and respect in just in boxing and life in general. So, what do, how do you think you use those as your guidelines? Just by people seeing me and saying, how you doing rather than what's happening. Because <laughs> the attitude that somebody shows you is the one that you have to, that you have to comprehend from what they're trying to tell you now. I don't want to do anything even though I've been through what I've been through in the past. That's history. But some I have bad, more bad, more good than bad. So I like that part. My wife's been real good to me too as far as uh, being there for me, you know. She kind of like my uplift because of the fact that you know, she'll tell me, hey, that's enough. Let's go do this. You got to go do this. So we do that. She's definitely a mother for the kids. So. And I look up to her for that too. Yeah, I can understand that basically. Like the folks I've trained with from all the year, these years have been very, giving me a good example. Not just the folks appearing movies tie. Like the gym, I, the gym where I go weightlifting, like, the guy who runs the place is really nice. Whenever I'm injured or something's wrong, he always tells me <laughs> when to fix it. Also, what to make sure I don't stress my limits. So basically, it's not just uh, not the, the goal, road into martial arts is not just about an inner reflection. It's also what you get from other people. Mm -hmm. But also, you kind of learn that because you realize from other people's experiences about how you can better yourself, but in your own unique way. Now I watch you and you guys up there, you know, since we're trading the same building, I watch you guys, you guys are working, you look excellent doing what you're doing. And you know, since me and the fact that because it's not too much boxing, but still when Joe's good enough to let us involve ourselves with your facilities, I just try to always put my put, put some of the things together what you guys do. And some of you guys' happenings is what's going on in boxing too. The way you guys have to keep your hands up, the way you have to stay busy, in order to accomplish something, you have to give more than what you take. That's what I like about that part too. Muay Thai is a good competitive sport, also. I think that's wonderful to hear. So I also have always respected boxing and all other martial arts. All martial arts styles have their unique strengths and weaknesses, but they always give something special to the person. And then you, yeah. so. What advice would you give to inspiring, not just boxers, but also anyone who wants to go into combat sports, who want okay. to make a name for themselves? Because we have lots of talented gyms in the area, like not Very just Peoria, Peoria Muay Thai, but KOK Boxing, mm -hmm. Combat Academy, that's basically what Peoria Fight Club's gym is going to be. Mm -hmm. There's also Peoria Athletic Club. Yeah, there's, there's a new... a lot of different places around. What advice would you give them? Well, the biggest part went to all the other boxing places, just the boxing places that we have to kind of kind of work together and get the, the talent and kind of put things together and come up with one plan rather than spin out on a lot of different angles. Because, you know, every, every city, Chicago, Detroit, California, they got that one fighter that comes out of there that they work with and they make it better. There might be another club or an organization, but they're not digging into each other. That's understandable. Like, what would you tell some young rising folks who are just starting out, who especially want to make a name for themselves? Take your time, choose, be careful what you do. Don't go with the bad part. Think about the good part and do the right thing, which is easy to do. Because, you know, there's good people got good advice, but you don't listen to all advice. All advice is not good for you. Because you have to pick, them, pick and choose your own self, especially when you got common sense. They say boxing is kind of a brutal sport. I mean, well, you figure like this, boxing can't be that brutal because, in fact, you just got hands coming at you. But in your sport, you got feet and hands coming at you. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to think about that, you know. So it's a, a combat sport's a good sport to be into because, I mean, tennis is just to a point to where they want to jump across the net. Basketball, you see it all the time fighting. So, you know, it's really nothing really safe anyway. 
like Bar Brandt told me this, like you can play tennis, you can play ba- baseball or football, but you can't don't play boxing because there is still a discipline in regarding it. Yeah. However, yes. but there is something telling kid giving kids that the right path, setting them on the right path, especially enjoyable. Yeah. Like this is actually a funny story that happened at Manning when I was teaching there. Some kids told me they were already told they could already fight because we're because we're these are their words, not mine, because they're black. So then I taught them here. Here's a technique you can use: shuffle your right leg between your behind your left leg to deliver more power into the punch. And they said, "Wow, your punches feel stronger." Right? And they said, "Yeah." And he said, "I thought you already knew how to fight." Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Because let's be honest about something: everyone in this world is born weak. The moment we come, we're born. We're born. We learn to be better. No one is born strong. Some people may have more. Take, it may be easier for them, but we all learn at our own unique paces. But you are right about something uh, in regards to basically how would you back, basically in cities like Chicago and Detroit, when all the gyms would come together to uplift a certain fighter. Mm-hmm. Peoria has that potential too, yeah. but no one, all the fighters usually have to leave Peoria in order to actually have fights. That's true. That's true. But I can tell to, I can tell my kids and what well, Muay Thai, Taekwondo, boxing, boxing major things, a little enough from the jump to hey, no matter what I show you, <clears throat> this is what I'm showing you what I know. If it ain't the best, I'll think it is the best because of the fact I'm just trying to show you. But you just gotta remember, there's always somebody better than you. But I always use that one thing. Remember Faze always said, there's always somebody better than you. I tell them from Jump Street, I say, I haven't met him yet. But I haven't met nobody better than me in boxing. If I win, lose, or draw, I still take a, take a, take a heave to myself and say, well, I'm going to still be okay. But I'm not going to go back and go behind the back and shoot him or anything stupid. I just say, you know, there's nobody better than you if you take care of yourself. And you walk away from the problem. Yeah, that's very understandable because... Kids, everyone, I think it's not just kids, but also middle-aged folks. There are two yes. people who resort to violence and using a gun. <clears throat> yeah, I tell them all, I tell them all the time, hey, man, do what you have to do. If you can't, if you can't go around them, you have to go through them and say, excuse me. But then that's all you can do. If there's no last resort, then you have to do what you have to do. Reach down. But I just hope you got something to reach down for. I ain't talking about guns. But you can always take things. The guns don't have to be the answers to no questions around here. There's people that can be taken down without a con- with just a conversation. Man, leave me alone. My mom got me doing this. My dad got me doing that. I got to fix this. I got to fix that. I ain't got time. I always tell kids, it's not your turn to do something stupid. There's enough people out here to take your turn. So... Basically, when you're not training or base training, what do you like to do? To, do you have any hobbies or any interests that you oh, use to relax? I do. I, I travel a lot. And we travel a lot. My wife and I, we travel so much. We're always constantly going. In fact, I retired and whatnot, finally. I was going back out to where I was working for quite a while, but then I gave that up. And I, I said, I'm going to sit back and relax and I'll see what God's got in store for me, you know? I'm enjoying my church. I'm going to Zion Baptist Church. You know, we're doing Reverend Sam Durham. He's my pastor. He does real good. He gets everything together. He talks like he wants to. He talks like he should. It's very encouraging. And Sam, like I said, Joseph's, he's real good with his gym. Jim's been really nice to me about working out there. Joe, with yourself, too. You know, we work out a little bit. Watch you do your thing. I get encouragement off that, you know. But like I said, you know, once you got God in your life, you can go on from there. So I'm going to pause and ask <clears throat> some different questions. So what was it like living with the boxing legend? <laughs> living with the boxing legend? Well, well he, he's a, first of all, he, he likes, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a talker, so, and he likes, he likes to be in, in the limelight. I, I'm, I'm more of a, a backseat person. You know, those, some of the boxing, you know, of course, it, it was uh, stressful, you know, watching him fight and getting ready for fights. But, but 
but all in all in all, I know that something happens that I I, I don't have to worry about anything because I know he's gonna he's gonna protect me from everything. But, but and he got the, he got the kids started and he kept them busy. He kept our boys busy doing different sports, so they were they never had time to get in trouble. So no, our kids never got in trouble on the streets because they're always either in the gym or on the football field doing doing something productive or doing taekwondo like he said so. yeah that's unrelatable like my dad basically when he was when i was younger told me to be like a sponge and always want to be eager to learn mm -hmm. so basically that's why i'm always eager to learn about different styles yeah. i basically am also learn not only that when you go to the gym i feel like you're not just learning there you're also meeting new people who have different who think differently from you who yeah. have completely different lives it's kind of like go, it's not the same it's like going to a church, you bond with others, right. you learn about each other's lives. Also, like, it's not just, gym culture isn't just a bunch of fools just fighting each other or training. It's also about creating authentic bonds. Yeah, yeah, and, and the boxing got us doing things together because when the kids were little, they started boxing. And, and uh, there was this guy named Louis Reels, and he always he told me, you're going to be sitting around here watching your boys, you might as well be doing something too. So that's how I got started judging amateur fights. So we've been doing that for over 35 years. So And we've done a lot of traveling all over the United States. So if I want to ask you both this question. What was, the, if, what was the most mesmerizing place you ever went to on vacation? Good question. I, I know. I, I love Jamaica, so, <laughs> so I'm gonna. I'm gonna have to say it's, it's, it's we Jamaica. Yeah, because we've been I, I we've been like there more California. than once. I kind of yeah. like California, but I like uh, Jamaica was nice. Like well, Jamaica. what it, one of the best cruises we did was a was a Mediterranean cruise. We flew to Barcelona, Spain, and we were there for a few days and got to see the city. It was really interesting, and then we went to different different uh, ports. cities, ports, to then we hit the Italy and Greece. That was, that's any, I'm, I recommend anybody to do a, a Mediterranean cruise. It's, it's wonderful and you get to see all the different cultures and, and sample all the different foods. It was, it was pretty great. Yeah, the Mediterranean culture is very unique. Yeah. It's very, it's warm, the architecture is beautiful, the food's amazing. Yeah, it is. The most mesmerizing place I've been to recently was Kenya. Okay. Like it, Kenya was, it was, I would just describe it as if you ever have the opportunity, go there. It is the experience of a lifetime. <laughs> yeah, like the the, the, fo the locals there, they are very friendly. Yeah. Like not everyone's friendly, going to be friendly everywhere. They're yeah. always mean people, but they're very friendly. They're very, they have a good sense of humor. They're courteous. Like yeah. we went for basically all over. We went landed in Nairobi. We went to the northern part called Samburu, which is on the border of Somalia and Kenya. Kenya. It's basically then we worked our way through the country. Like we saw we saw elephants, lions, we saw two, one leopard. All the animals of Africa we, of the Kenya it's, it was a, it's a mesmerizing sight. Cuz when you go when you go explore, you want to learn it makes gives you a feeling that there's always makes you want to respect learn more about the world. Yeah, it's a little wonder, but it also makes <clears> you <throat> appreciate when you once you get started exhausted that how much you, what you have at home. Right, exactly. It does. It, it makes you appreciate more that that we that we here in the United States have. We just don't know how how great we have until you see other countries. Uh, and I would like to venture further, you know, like in Africa. And I I to work my way up to these plane to these plane rides. The most I've ever flown so far is nine hours. So so I got to work my way up to to the to the uh, to the to the long flights. Uh, yeah. this, this one, but I, I, I would love to go to Madagascar. That's where my father's people's from. Oh. Madagascar, so I would, I would love to go there. I don't know if I got people over there or not, but they were born there. His father's family were from there. Oh, you're, so your father was an Im your father was an immigrant from Madagascar? Right. His, his people, people, his people, people, people were. were his, oh, his wife yeah. was born in Kentucky, yeah. but, but his ancestors. <clears throat> came from Madagascar. Oh, that's very yeah. interesting. Madagascar itself is a very unique country. That's what I hear. Basically, I mean, culturally speaking, also, they eat a lot of, t of fruit called tamarind there. We eat a lot in India, too. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's where the cartoon comes from. <laughs> Crazy thing, those lemurs 
in the Madagascar movie. Right. They're, they are addicted. <laughs> they are addicted to tamarind. Yeah. Like, they eat it. That's It's 70% of their diet. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, if you could see, actually, how can you think we could... Do you, can you think martial arts can change people's lives for the better? I know it could because of the fact that kids nowadays, they're being led to an area that they don't have to be in. Yeah, kids these days don't want to fight. They, they, don't, just, they don't want to fight. They want, them, they want a quick fix. Instead. They want a quick fix. But see, a lot of them be... There's more kids that want to get into boxing, Muay Thai, Taekwondo, whatever the fact may be. But I encourage... Kids, no matter what it is, whether you like doing it, as long as it's got an S in front of it, it's better. Sports is where the money's at. Sports is where it's going to be at. Sports is where your life should be at. But, you know, you can always go, like I said, when I was in high school, there were big names, Bobby Hummels, Wayne McClain, different people like that. Were, but they would, I would just get on the bench, and I got tired of it. But I never would do nothing. I stayed as long as I could. But then I, then I had a chance to get into boxing. And I said, well, let me try this here. And he said, well, it's just you and him. And the other man's in there. He's going to tell you what to do. That's kind, of, kind of interesting. Then found out that it was something to do to keep me going and keep me keep my mind straight. And like I said, my oldest brother had did it, but it was so many years in between us that I didn't get the grip like he got. And I got my own and helped me because of the fact that his name came up quite a bit, but the older people that were helping me was my support. That's understand. <clears throat> that's understandable. Like it's always important to learn, and always regardless of whether it's sport or art or science, because there's an old another <clears throat> Roman saying basically: you have. To, it's important for men to basically learn how to learn marital prowess and basically be better but also want to learn True. otherwise you got you got basically got society divided to cowards and idiots mm-hmm. so what do you, if you're, how long have you lived in Peoria for were you born here I was born here born and raised I was I've mo- I was born in Boston but I've moved here since I've lived here since I was five so I do consider this my home so if you could change, if you could change Peoria, what would you do? Well, the only thing I would change would be like I mean, more sports enthusiasts or more sports active. I mean, because they got the favorites going on now, but there's see people think that you can't get involved. But they got leagues, they got different things that a person can do, boxing, Muay Thai is another thing too, but. You know, I got people that I grew up with that I went to school with, like Kelly O'Keefe. You know, he was Taekwondo. He did Taekwondo from grade school. <coughs> he got inducted to the Taekwondo Hall of Fame with Chuck Norris. Wow. And he's so, in Peoria? Yeah, he's in Peoria. Where he retired from the city of Peoria. He was a, well, he's a policeman now. He's part of this Peaky Police now. Yeah, he, he's still around. I talk to him all the time. Matter of fact, my grandson's getting ready to start taking class with it too, I hope, eventually. That's that's amazing. <clears throat> like, your nephew Eddie's also a legend. Oh, Eddie Parker? Yeah. He is. He's real good at the sport. Eddie's an excellent. I mean, he's the kind of person that he can beat you up and didn't, didn't make you laugh. You know, he's good. He's good. Eddie's, Eddie Parker's real good. He's been doing it a long time. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's like it's amazing how many talented martial artists come from Peoria. It's like you could just walk around the corner, you There's find a lot somebody. Of hidden talent also too. Because most, uh, I hate it when people say Peoria is just a boring place. They say that too. I've heard that lots of times. I know. Like I actually had a temper tantrum with my older brother a few days ago because he said that Peoria is not interesting. <laughs> It's what you make it. I mean, if, you, if you're not into nothing, you ain't going to find nothing. I mean, you got to make yourself do what you want to do, like me with my boxing, like with the boxing. I'm trying my best now to work with Joe with my boxing. If I, if I could ever be one day hit, 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 get rich, it would be a lot different, too. I would hurry it along, but the things I have, I would hope to do by God's will if I could get it right. 
I can make this a heck of a town, boy. With boxing, Muay Thai, whatever it was, just be sports enthusiasts. I mean, bring the people from everywhere to see what we've done. Because there's a lot of talent in Peoria. I think it would, like, I think that it is possible to do. Because here's the, what Robert Bell did with KOK's event just recently. Like, he got a whole bunch of people there. And of course, I shouldn't, why am I saying this? Because you were there. I was there for him. <laughs> Like, the fact that it showcased not only what Peoria has, but I think he should expand on that, yeah. basically, and not just include boxing, but Muay Thai, Jiu-Jitsu, karate. Yeah, they can still keep a separate plan, but they can, this how many they can work together and make this thing work. Because all it is is just trying to get the kids interested in something that's going to benefit them and the people in back of them to go further and further in life without, you got to do what happens is what happens, God does God picks the timing when it's going to happen, but until it does, he gives you the encouragement to continue on with your life. That, yeah. is, tr that is true. Like, work, the kids in the school, like, they, with the after, I, I originally, when I was, work, started working for Art Inc., I sort of teach the, I tried creating them creative writing. They were kind of bored with it. That's why I requested that I switch to martial arts, because mm -hmm. I'd be better at that, and also I'd give them something more encouraging. They're enthusiastic about martial arts. Mm -hmm. Like, some kids are more intimidated by it because it's understanding. Like, you don't play martial arts, and it can no. be. It's a matter of discipline and being okay with making mistakes. But I think it gives children something unique. Mm -hmm. Like, I think they do need to put martial arts in school. Like, if you go to Japan, it's kind of crazy what they do there. They have martial arts classes, archery, swords. Of course, their their country is a bit different from ours. But, mm -hmm. in fact, it's basically what you, like, learning... For the sake of basically with art, science, and merit, learning about martial skills is not separate. Yeah. The two halves of the same coin. Yeah, you have a point there because of the fact that, I mean, I, I tried martial arts myself. I tried Taekwondo, but, man, I went into I had two competitors times I tried went into it. I fought twice. I lost both times, but I was doing more punching than kicking. And, you know, not to sound like a different person, but um, uh, Bruce Lee was an idol of mine. I mean, he's the, I look I look up to this man, even though he's gone, I still think about him, talk about him, watch his movies. He just, he was my man, so to say, you know. And then naturally, you know, I got like my mom and Ali's and different things like this, but I mean, of all, it was Bruce Lee. I mean, Bruce Lee was someone was a unique person. Like the man, most people don't realize this about him, but he was actually bullied when he was a kid. Exactly. Because he, all his movies. <laughs> so because he was, he's, most people don't realize this about him because he was actually one fourth German. Exactly. So he was actually the guy who did things like he could push, did thousands of push ups. He could poke a hole through a coke can. Back in your, this is back in the youth when your days of youth when coke cans were steel rather than aluminum. Yeah. So that was the, the man. The fact that he died of an allergic reaction is so crazy. He didn't tell him, but he was sick. Yes, because the thing is, he was he was feeling sick, so they gave him some medicine. Yeah. So the thing is, he had an allergic reaction from medicine. But the fact that man even today still has such an influence, not just in in the movies Enter the Dragon, but also what he could, the people he taught. Like mm -hmm. I know Eddie told me that he went that he didn't train. He trained from a guy who learned from Bruce Lee. Right. Right. I mean, Bruce Lee was uh, he's incredible. You, not to go, off the, go off the conversation, but Muhammad Ali was another person. He didn't know when to stop. But that's a different sport. But still, regardless, age was a factor there, too. But age is more of a factor in boxing than it would be in Taekwondo or, or Muay Thai, I would say. But you have to be, but all of it can be, still be done. But you can do the exhibition thing rather than go straight into competition. That is understandable. Like, Muhammad Ali was an amazing person also. Because right. the fact that George Foreman was a, George Foreman was a monster. Oof. The fact my father watched it while on TV while they happened. That basically he wore him down and then finished George Foreman off. He did. Because, again, different fighters have their own styles. Like, it's not just about physical strength, but also agility and endurance. And that's a good thing to say because of the fact that James Quick Tillis and Mike Tyson, I worked out with James Quick Tillis up team rounds. 
But he fought Mike Tyson for the first time. He was the very first person to take Mike Tyson the distance because all he did was move. He didn't stand still and get hit like the other idiots did. And that's the only reason why they lost because they said, I can take it because he's small, he's compact. James Booth to us moved and gave him some gave him angles. He couldn't do it. He did it. He, people thought he was going to get knocked out, but he didn't. He got hit a few times, trust me. He got hit hard, but he did not stand there and take that full impact. He was on the move. Ali was perfect at that. He was perfect at that. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate what happened to him. Yes, it is. Like, I, I actually watched this video of him, like, basically when he was in the late stages of Parkinson's. He still could beat beat Mike Tyson in a game of chess. He needed help watching. I mean, the fact that... I would take the day between Mike Tyson and Ali. I say Ali was still beating because, in fact, he would... Because everybody thought that Ali was going to lose his, lose against... Uh, George Foreman. George Foreman. But what did he do? He did something nobody else thought about doing. Just carry him around. Because the thing is, I, I here's a, Muhammad Ali was both a mixture of... Like, there are some folks who focus more on agility and some folks who focus on... I think Muhammad Ali was somewhere in the perfect middle. Like his, mm-hmm. And take another question, too. I know there's not met, too. I talk to him like I'm talking to you. Buster Douglas, when he, when he fought Mike Tyson, Buster Douglas told me, he said, I'm going to knock the chump out. I said, everybody go, oh, man, you, they thought he was going to get knocked out. Buster Douglas, he's from Ohio. We used to take fighters from Ohio and just give us fighters just to have us as something to knock out. You know, but because they wouldn't have their different trade up fighters wouldn't train that tough. Buster Douglas come out, took Mike Tyson, and knocked him out within six rounds, I think it was. Man, because he was standing in front of him. Buster Douglas pulled a rapper out of his head. His mother's in the hospital. He had a lot of inspiration too though. It's amazing. that's an amazing story. Like it's amazing how many stories you've seen, how many people you've I talked about it. I'm not jump out. <laughs> Buster Douglas told me I was on. We fought together down in Atlantic City. He told me I'm not, I'm not just jump out. That's a. And he sure did it too. When you just told me that, I thought he wasn't gonna. He, he was just the completely <laughs> polar opposite was gonna happen. Oh, he stopped that too, boy. He, Tyson was knocking out everybody within three, four rounds, man. You know that. Buster said, "Man, I'm gonna shoot." I brought Buster about three or four times, man. Because the fighters in Ohio, they were bringing it up to the ones that starting out of here to try to give me help to build their records up. But there's always a few in there that, not all of them, but there was only a few they was just taking, just throw at the, throw at the people. But Buster Douglas, man, I talked to him, boy, he said, I'm not going to jump out. And he sure did. Hmm. I know Buster like I know you, man. Buster's cool. Is he... Is- do you still talk to him? Well, I haven't talked to Buster in years, man. He's just off to his own thing. He got me over two or three million dollars in his pocket probably anyway, but, you know, yeah, he, he's doing all right. Yeah, that's, a, that, like, how many legends do we have in town? Besides you, of course. <sighs> man, I don't know. I don't know. I know there's a lot of basketball players here, but that was in high school. Our generation, but I don't know. Like, let me rephrase the question. Like, martial arts legends. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a couple of them right here. You know, like Kelly O'Keefe. Who? Eddie. Who? Eddie. Eddie Parker. Yeah, Eddie Parker. Eddie, Eddie Parker went too. He didn't kind of go out as Vera Harris. Yeah, Vera Harris. Kelly O'Keefe, Eddie Parker, yeah. Vera Harris? Or yeah, Vera, Vera Harris. She's, yeah, she used to be a policeman. Oh, no, she yeah. went to the hospital. Yeah, she went to the hospital. So, yeah, who, 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 so tell me more about her. Oh, Vera Harris, she was real good. She was a black woman. She was, she could kick you, she could knock a hole in that wall. <laughs> she was, she retired from the hospital. She was really a good girl. Yeah, she talked yeah. for a while, for a yeah, long time. Yeah, she talked Taekwondo for a long time. That's Not long ago, it's been a while since she taught. Because my grandson went to her school. That's amazing. Does she still live in Peoria? Oh, you see, I'm quite sure she's here somewhere. Look her up. This place is, 
Because to be honest, in some ways, Peoria is like a maze. It is. It's, 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 it's got some, uh, it's still some good talent walking around here, but people don't recognize because they don't know. I mean, being fair, I'm a little older. But still, there's, there's some good talent running around here still. So, yeah. That still got potential, but they ain't going to do no competitive-wise. But looking at looking back on their, what do they call those things? Uh, Exhibition? No, the looking look of old bats. So look, look, you know. Are you talking about looking back in history? Or yeah, look back in history. You know, they're, they're definitely in there. So, yeah. like, it's, an, it's amazing how many all these stories are in here. So... <clears throat> Let me get my thoughts together. Ah. So, what, when you first started out, how did you first realizing, what was the trick you teach your, tell yourself how, what, let me rephrase it, let me get my words. Ah. So, when you were trying to improve yourself, and you, how would, what would you tell yourself? That, that I got to pull all the stuff behind and try to move forward with what I want to do. Because of the fact that no matter what, there's always somebody out there that's coming up behind you that's going to try to take away from you. So if you were you so if you're ever afraid when you were in a fight and you were afraid, what would you do? That's one thing about it. I was afraid every time I got in the ring. But you had no other choice. There's too many people yelling. There's a man telling you, "Let's go." You had to compete. When lose the draw. Because basically, one thing about people, one reason, one of the reasons why I also don't compete, or basically why I don't time spar in general, is because let's be honest, I'm as timid, I'm as timid as a bunny. So because basically, I get startled easy, I back off. Yeah, I understand that perfectly. But I mean, that, that's the part about being in a competitive mode, because of the fact that it's not like a baseball team. Cause you got hey, you know, if you hit the ball and you miss, the other guy might catch it. But you know, in a situation like boxing, Muay Thai, Taekwondo, Jiu Jitsu, that's the one on one. If you don't swing or kick, they're going to swing or kick. You love your step between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, so here, now I'm going to ask you in regards to the polar opposite. What happens if you get too angry in the ring? Like, let me rephrase that. You get so, you keep go out swinging. Think without actually thinking or defense. It could throw you all the way off. It's one thing about it, you have to keep cool. You got to be cool. got to keep calm. Because the fact that you know what's going to happen when you came, when you signed the paper, when you rode there, this guy's going to try to hurt me. <laughs> He's going to try to knock me out. He's going to try to hit me hard. Put that in your mind. Say, well, I'm going to try to avoid as much as I can. And another thing, too, is my wife, you know, she was a lot of inspiration for me because of the fact that I know she was in the audience. But I lose the draw, draw whatever I come to. I wanted to say, Francis, that's you the way I was. Best. You did your best. That's a reassuring thing. It helped me a lot. And my mother couldn't stand boxing. She couldn't stand boxing. She, my mother could not stand boxing. I took her to one boxing match. I'll never take her no more. I couldn't take her no more. Because she hated it. Because she said, you hit my baby again, I'm going to blah, 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 blah. And what can I say, Mama, you can't do that. <laughs> she was like that. She would actually get mad about it. Mama, you can't do that. Yeah. My dad, he was just the opposite. You know, he sat there and do his thing. But. So, yeah, moms, this is not no disrespect to you at all. But moms can be so, but moms can be so weird. Oh, man, she was different with her boys, man. My boys would get in there and... She be yelling. You know, I'd be yelling, oh, tell them what man. to do. They'd be mad they didn't, didn't do what I told them to oh, do. Right? Yeah. That's understand. No, they're, they're, <laughs> like for example, my mom complains whenever I come back and I'm all sweaty and stuff, and, <laughs> yeah. and my feet are all dirty. Can't you, can't you, can't your guys clean the room, clean the gym? I know that's kind of your job. Exactly. But, but the thing is, it's a gym, mom. You're supposed to get well, figuratively. You're gonna get dirty. <laughs> I mean. Very I mean, true. The fact that okay, this is well, I can't believe I'm saying this out loud. The fact that I feel like I went, I want to drag my folks to the my family to the gym. Hey, I ain't mad. It's true that true that. Because at least at least not see just, what it's about. See what happened. Why am I dirty? Why am I getting hit? Yeah, because it's not. I understand martial arts isn't for everybody, mm -hmm. but sometimes you just need learning something, seeing something you learn. Like it's actually this is actually a really funny story. 
why I joined the Peoria Muay Thai gym. So there is a movie called Ong Bak. It's an action movie, basically, where Muay Thai is used a lot. So I was fascinated with Muay Thai and wanted to learn. So one day while I was at Peoria, I had this restaurant called Thai Time. It's not, it does, it's not around anymore, unfortunately. It was on Main Street, close to Tan Lin, basically. That's where I found the ad for Peoria Muay Thai. So that's where, I, the, here's, the, I went to their very first gym. If you go down Knoxville, as you go past the, close to the intersection of War Memorial, it was this dinky gym that was, it was tiny. Really tiny that when I think everyone started sweating, the window starts steaming up. Mm-hmm. That small. Basically, it was on Knoxville. I can't, so basically, that was, then we moved to the place near Galeno Road. Then we kind of came to this place. So I've been there with these folks for a long time. It's almost like we're like a band of brothers or something. Yeah, so it's good people. Yeah. So it's amazing how quirky and so and sent like you know I'm I'll let you go first in regards to this. Okay. What was the funniest experience you ever had at the gym? As far as sparring or just working out, because my cousin Jose Junior was at the gym that I told you that. He fought so many different people from, from Mike Tyson up, Mike Tyson down. He was the most sufficient person as far as boxing goes that taught me what to do. He wasn't a trainer, but you get hit so much, you have to start learning how to do this and do that and do this. And I sparred him more than I ever wanted to. I would come home and my wife could tell you I have this and that. She said, I told you about doing this. Told, but I mean, he was so much bigger than me. But but still, it was just the thing about it. We, we, we laid on each other's back. You know, we, so, you know, he was my inspiration. So yeah, so before I actually went to Muay Thai, I was training on Sundays with this guy with a, he was a, he's actually an Olympic kick athlete, like gold medalist kickboxer named Rustam Olmasov. He, he moved to Florida a couple of years ago. This guy would, did the equivalent of turning me inside out, basically. Made me walk, squat and walk. Basically made me do crocodiles. That man put me through hell. But dude, that guy, I came out the other side stronger. I ain't mad at just what I'm saying. Because my cousin was saying, but I guess I once again. The, the, combo I, me so hard. the combo I mentioned, the jab, hook, cross. He started making me do that in regards to disrupting the rhythm. Like, taught me the basics. The reason why I kind of started out easy at Mu- Muay Thai, better than rest people, because he kind of gave me the... The t- the start because let's be honest I'm gonna be honest about something I went to Muay Thai as an appetizer. He was, oh yeah, he was, that right. that dude would be the main course. I know what you mean. I know exactly what you mean. Really? So, yeah, I want to hear more about this story. It was good. It was good. I had, I had no, no nothing bad to say about boxing. It was a couple of downfalls, but other than that, though. Like what I mean by not because it just like basically you would have the easy workout. Then on one day you have the very difficult workout that trained you to yeah. your utmost. And one thing about me, I can say this for myself, you know, when I trained, I trained. I was endurance. I mean, I was constantly training. I ran. I mean, I, I even had an eight hour job. I had a family to support. I made some house. She worked along with me very well. Honey, I'll be back. Well, I wouldn't say honey all the time, but I said Joanne. <laughs> my call baby like that. That's my sweet like But anyway, you know, I always tell all the time, I'll be back. I get off work. And I'm, I'm hitting the road. I ran, I ran. I kept, I kept myself in decent shape. Except for a few little bad habits I had. But I got through that. And I'm really good now. Yeah, that's understandable. Truth be told, I make a lot of mistakes during jump rope. <laughs> and I admit, I, am t- I don't run. That is something oh. I beat myself over the shoulder for, and it's something I need oh, to do. That, that's, that, that's, I like biking. I like, right. of course, biking doesn't work out you out the same way running does. Yeah, we just the opposite with you. We got bikes and we don't run like we should. Cause they, we the, run more. Cause okay, cause this is a this is actually crazy. This is I don't do it anymore because it exhausted me too much. Also, it's coming too cold. <laughs> it makes you work parts of your body that don't normally work. Like basically, I'd bike. I my. Place is close. To, well, I do. My place is close to on out the intersect close to Knoxville. So I would drive drive to the Rock Island Trail. I take that to go to the gym and also to the gym where I do weight lift lift weights at. So because they're clo- they're actually very close. Unfortunately, it was taking its toll on my legs so to the point which I had to moderate it. 
Yeah, but it's not to cut you off or anything like that, but when you cut, when you lift weights, I see a lot of people, you know, the big chest and everything. You know, that's it's nice if you like it. I'm not into it, but anyway, the muscles, you know, that's not really intimidating to me. You know, I think, you know, it's just hurting you more than it's, it's, it's helping you. To get on them is different. Like with boxing, I tell all the kids they want to get the big muscles, it's fine. But you get on them, you get off of them. When you get off of them, you lift them what you want to do. But if you're done, you got to shoot around. Keep your hands loose. Keep your arms loose. Keep your muscles stretched. Don't get tightened up. Yeah, actually, Rob, he's the, he, Robert Swander, he's the guy, he runs fitness counseling. That's the place where I work out. He actually tells me that I do need to get relaxed during it. Because he actually, mm -hmm. he's a story, his story is unique in itself. He used to train, he used to train folks at West Point. So basically, one thing I learned actually through boxing, I actually learned through boxing how to actually be a better weightlifter. Mm -hmm. One technique, especially when you're doing it, when you rotate your shoulder. Yeah, you you're doing, be careful with that. No, when you when right, doing, right. doing doing lat like dumbbells, whatever. Yeah. No, doing lat like you know when you do the rower. Oh. Okay. Using that because basically the same same kind of mo movement you use when you punch. Mm -hmm, exactly. Because basically, it made me think, why don't I just apply this to weightlifting and vice versa? Because sometimes. You learn, if boxing, like I said, I know we keep saying the same things that. over. Yeah. Basically, when you learn boxing, you realize something that can be applied somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. See, I'll be boxing is all parts of your body, like Taekwondo and more time, and you're using everything in your body, arms, feet. But in boxing, you, go, you, need, you need as much stretch you can, you can keep that person back. So I got to tell my, you know, I got to tell anybody I train in boxing. If you get a problem to where you got to tell somebody, you can't run to mom and daddy all the time. If you have another choice, you have another choice. That's not me and Violet either. But the boxing would just say, make you kill the problem. Yeah. You know, I've never actually told you a funny story. Well, it's actually, so basically, my, so basically while I was training one kid at, one of the kids at, um, at, at Manual, really nice kid named Jalen Copton, really a respectful young man. So we had a little bit of an accident. One day, he tr I was holding the pads. He basically tried to kick, but he went a little bit too high and knocked me right in the head. <laughs> so basically, if it was a Looney, if this was, it was if this was Looney Tunes, I'd be having birds twinkling all around my head, circling. So I was fine. It was an accident. I was not angry at all because accidents always happen. Yeah, so it's amazing I, how talented young kids are in school. Not just Emmanuel, Richwoods. There's a lot of talent in my Like green, another... another like white, green, and yellow. Like, There's a lot of talent. Like another student of mine named Taewon Johnson. He's the boy, young man I mentioned who was, he did football, he did cross-country wrestling. I've heard that name before. He's Robert Brandt's nephew. Really nice kid. Mm -hmm. He actually beat me in a mock sparring match. I've heard that name before. Like, actually, like really talented kid. Like, I feel like boxing can save kids. Like, most people... Any sport can save a kid, but just think about it. They don't have the time. They don't want to take the, the patience. You know, right now I'm going to be a champion. Right now I'm going to be a... Like... You can't do it that way. Like, Taewon's... Uh, like, Mike Tyson, for example. Mm -hmm. his, his dad... I don't... His dad wasn't there, I think. After his mom died, his boxing coach adopted him. Mm -hmm. he basically, give him something... Someone to... So giving someone to look up to and someone to be there for him, like with Taewon, like his dad was not. His dad was arrested for murder. His mom took care of him. He said he was a bad kid, but then one day a teacher told him that you'll never amount to anything. That and he That's felt, not, you know, I would never say that. I know, because here's the thing: you always if we if kids don't look up to us or we or inspire them, we fail them. Because you, for those who come after you, you always want to be someone they look up to. Because yeah. if you can't be the person they look up to, they'll have nobody. Because they'll just be drifting in the void with nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Both, both my boys, they, they followed my steps a few times. I mean, they, they both won state championships. My daughter went, went somewhere too, but she got like I said, what she got to do is nice because she ended up good and she's doing the right thing now. She's they both my, they're all they're all doing okay now. They're all all my kids are doing good. But sports wise, they love sports. They love football. They play football, but you know, I mean, they're, they're the sports enthusiasts. They like it. Cause like, give kids something they love to do. Like, it's not just not just sports. Sports yeah. is important. It, 
but also something art related or anything in general because yeah. passion discipline and passion they can they're not necessarily they can there are moments where they both conflict with each other but there are both when you both blend to each other in a way that they synergize with each other you have amazing results I mean, I think that's why how we old. That's how you become achieve glory, basically. True. Like a mixture of passion and discipline. Yeah, I agree with you. I got discipline and everything. Well, we, that's impossible for everything. We all have moments we slip. I mean, that's the moment. <laughs> I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna slip, but you still gotta you gotta work on that. Yeah. So. Uh, because, like, with school districts, I wish they would introduce... Like, I know I keep talking about this, but they really should introduce martial arts. They have wrestling, but usually that's seasonal. Yes, yeah, that's the thing about you. I guess they figure, like... Well, I don't know what they probably do or they don't, but... But they figure boxes are uh, not a good sport. And Muay Thai, I don't know why, but they have that in sport. I mean... I mean, a contact sport, as long as it's legal... As long as it's judged, it shouldn't be a violent thing. I understand if kids are, if the kids are protected, like they're wearing headgear, right? Shed, exactly. Basically, gloves. They got time. Yeah, because yeah. 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 in amateur boxing, the, their major thing is the protection of the boxer. That's their number. Uh, that's their number. That's, that's, that's their reference. that's their number one. Because that's understand. One I understand if you're not careful. With bo- that's why. That's what like what Robert Brand said. You you don't play boxing. Basically, it's important that someone safety is very important. That's why also I would lecture. I also would tell kids that basically if they ever abuse what I told them, I'd kick them out of the class permanently because martial arts is not if it's not can be a danger not just for others but also for yourself if it's abused. Yeah, we we've done my wife and I. We've done state, regional, nationals. We've traveled with boxing, and I mean as far as you know. I have stopped a lot of fights in my career that, because I don't want to see no punishment. Let them come back and do it another day. But don't put them if they're not ready. Yes, that's understandable. A lot of coaches, a lot of coaches don't think like they should. They're just trying to get in there and get it done. That, so, that know, is reckless and stupid. I've seen it lots of times. And I stop them. Why you stop this? Why you this? Why you that? I mean, the boy's going to get beat if I don't let it happen. Because it's also important that we, if we do, if kids are taught martial arts, they do it in the right way. Mm-hmm. Basically, I know it's, I'm not the kind of person to just restrict, be over-restrictive. Because, like, it, having a bad role model can all be as detrimental as, as having no role model. Yeah. See, yeah. A, lot of people, a, lot, a lot of coaches are like that. You know, they, why you stop? Why you stop? For kids, it's obvious what the problem is. You're either scared, or that's basically what it boils down to. You're just scared. I've seen it a hundred times. When you don't want to stop them, I stop them. Let him go. Why are you stopping him? Let him go. Man, excuse me, but he don't want to fight anymore, man. Why let him take more punishment? He's got a headgear on, but still, you never know. Yeah, it's just as much psychological as it is physical. It does. So we be careful. Like I said, we, we, like people say, you know, you got to be careful. When you, you, I'm a referee. She's a judge. If she don't think they did it right, she'll mark them down. You know, if I don't think they do it right, I'll stop it. So it's just how it goes. You got to respect those that, that don't want to respect you because... When you're a referee, man, or a judge, why you why you give him that? Why didn't you stop it? No, no, the boy's still swinging, no. But yet there's another person on the other hand. Oh, he's still doing this, but crap, he's doing that off his instinct. He ain't doing it because he's trying to defend himself. He's just doing it. He's probably getting ready to go down, too, so. Yeah, basically, when you're at your limit, you start to basically, you, you're, you lack discipline. The coaches you're... can't see that. You know, there are signs you can tell that when someone is at their limit, especially when Trust they're trying to... I know exactly what you're saying. Basically, like, I feel it during training when basically my technique gets sloppier. Yeah. Basically, when you're basically at your mental... When you're such... And I'm right, I'm, I'm like this to them people, the kids, you know. I'm right, like, this is close I am, closer than you are right now with these kids, you know. 
So I can I that's un, that that is fully understandable. Hmm. So you think I'm going to talk about here? No, I mean a lot of the stuff like this conver. Oh. Hmm. Let me think. So, if you could ever, if there's a moment in your life, in your life, well, if you could, basically, if you could redo it, what would you do in regards to your boxing career? Well, number one thing I would do, I would have had a better manager. I had a good one at the end. I had excellent trainers. My my manager was kind of different. He was a good one, but he was just it's a long story behind that. I'd have a better, I'd have better facilities as far as training goes. I'd have more eye on. You know, that's what I try to do with my kids now. Have eye on, watch you, try to make you do more than what you know I, I should have done. That's it. Because, like, in some ways, like I speak, I cannot speak as a fighter for someone who's fought professionally. I speak pure, purely as an outsider. But it feels like. When you're getting managing and trying to get a fight itself is a business transaction. Mm. Like you gotta feel like you have the right reputation if you yeah. have the right manager. Yeah. I mean, I feel it's like, that, like that. Trust me, it's, it's like the pros it is. Like it's almost like it kind of outputs people of actually going into pros or actually trying to fight yeah. competitively. Yeah. Well, see, a lot of times the amateurs is a little bit different from the pros because the pros is uh, I'm trying to build this guy up, and the amateurs is kind of the same way. But some is a lot. I'm not trying to take, don't disrespect what I'm trying to tell you right now, but you got some people that come from different places that, they, you know, in the amateurs in boxing, the kid can have two or three books. They can take this book and go here with it and use this book at home. This book here they're going away with it's, it's, it's false. But the one at home, you ain't got no drugs, and mama's there, your cousin, friends. No, oh, that ain't this thing. But you go here, you can have a different name. You know, or it might have the same name and it's a different record. See, people are known for that. I'm not to say the Windy City's like that. They got a chance of a bad thing about switching books around. That is. It's really improper, but wow. you, they don't catch it. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But a guy can be somewhere else and be undefeated and stay at home, and you can see his loss two or three times. That's, wow. It's just, everything's dirty, man, you know, some kind of way. That's, it's just, it's the truth. Hmm. Do you feel like that really discourages people from competing? It not so much discourages them, but it doesn't, it doesn't make you, it don't make you feel capable of accomplishing what you want to do because of the fact that you threw this wrong on me, and I and I can finally gonna get this guy, and I'm gonna lose. Yeah, that's un, like, hmm, base. That's something to think about. People like you could switch be, books, man. Like you'd be a very talented person, but you're basically, if you have the right wrong manager, or you have to deal with bureaucracy and all that, you basically could have your career derailed before it starts. It's political. Boxing is very, very, very political. Also, that, I, do you feel like that in regards to what happens here, especially? Because if we could become like a martial arts hub where people come to, do you feel I'm like that's that? that? Do you feel like that's holding it back? Also, no, no, no. Uh -uh. I think that we just have to kind of start reaching out to one another in boxing instead of trying to separate ourselves and try to be greedy to where we just try to come together as one or two that work together rather than five or six boxes, boxing places going on. Because everybody's trying to get kids. I'm trying to get kids. You got kids. But they don't want to come to me because of the fact that I'm just not you. Yeah, the clickishness of Peoria the the, it's, it's, like a, it's like a cancer. It's it basically is. killing. It's almost like it's killing us. I want to talk about you too. Because, like, not just that, like, we... I'm not going to name names, but Fury Muay Thai, we've had to deal with clickishness also, <laughs> and that's held us back a little bit. I, I think, what how, how what do you think could be the best way to dissolve the clickishness? It's just 
try to um, have some shows and work together with it. And if then we get, oh man, why don't we just bring your kids over here? Or why don't we come over to you? Or let's see what we can do with this. But nowadays, you know, I, like the show they had Saturday, it should have been a lot better. It was compact. It was okay, but it should have been a lot better. You know, you got to be careful what you do. Some of the audience ain't 10 or 12 years old. I mean, some of the music they was playing was uncalled for, you know. But other than that, though, there's a few things that they did but, but in my opinion, wasn't great. Because I think if we can change, we can't, that, having more events would be amazing. Because not only that, we could also, we could just, we could also have more folks come here. We'd get more people to get involved in their city more. Plus, it'd also make the city a lot more money. Like, have events at Expo Garden or even the Civic Center. And those places are hard to get to without some politics or something. The thing is, the fact that, they, I know, it's like, it's very, it's like you, we can actually make this pure city better, but then the clickishness comes in and it kind of holds yeah, us back. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of happenings in Peoria. Trust me, there's, a, there's some talent running around here. There's political talent running around here. There's all kinds of different people around here. But, you know, who am I to say, well, man, why don't we just get together and work this place over, man? The opportunities are there people are some greedy. There's a lot of greed too, though. I think there are people who are there are people out there who are getting sick of the clickishness, uh, yeah. and they are trying to change something. I think if that will eventually, the clickishness in Peoria will go away. Now, I mean, for them, it'll, let me rephrase that. It'll get better. It'll get better to the point where it won't might not be much of a problem as because there'll always be clickishness. I won't deny that, but I think it's, right. But that just got that's got to separate. When it comes to trying to get something done, the cookies and stuff like you're saying. I think it has, the, our city does have the potential. I think we should, like a lot of guys said earlier, that the gloves down, the gloves up, guns down event, that's a, that should be a catalyst for what ha should start bringing yeah, in more. When you say that, do you, what do you mean by that? Like have more events like that, but also include different martial arts schools. Yeah. Also, now I'm making a semi, like, not, I think, make it potentially a monthly thing. Yeah, yeah that'd be nice. A meeting. I mean, we need meetings, too. Yes, I know. I ain't talking about, you know, come over and beg, you know, but I mean, just common sense, you know, free judgment. You want to come over and we just make conversation? Let's have a, a city meeting, let's have a neighborhood meeting, let's have a house meeting, or whatever, you know, just. Something's going to make a person try to think positive rather than negative.